Go ahead. I'm listening to Where's, where's Nathan Ever. Okay, stop. Stand still. Hi, everybody. This is Big Inkovich. And this is Rich Outfield. And this is the second worst marathon ever. That's right. And this is the second rule of the second worst marathon ever. You do not talk about worst marathon ever. <laughs> See rule number one. So rule number two of Pixar's rules for storytelling. You got to keep in mind what's interesting to you as an audience, not what's fun to do as a writer. They can be very different. Huh. Okay, so that's a really writerly one. Right? Well, it does say the word writer in it. <laughs> right, but whereas, you know, we care about somebody's failures more than their successes is something that we all understand as an audience. But what's interesting to you as a writer is not necessarily interesting to an audience. It feels like much more writer-centric. Yeah. You yeah. have to be a writer to understand that. And... I don't know how we're going to come up with an example of that because that one's hard. I mean, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. That one is definitely harder to pinpoint, to point at, and say. Especially since there's not a lot that we know about what they didn't use, right? As opposed to what we did use. I guess if you wanted to go back to what you said in the first episode where you talked about Toy Story. And where they said, oh, we're not going to do these Disney things because that sucks. And they say all this kind of stuff as, as writers. That's what they want to do because they think that it's more important to do those kind of things. Take a stand for, I don't know, uh, doing something different than everybody else is doing or whatever. And then... Joss Whedon shows up and says, you know what you need to do? It's all these things that you said you wouldn't do. Because that's what's going to make your story good. It is. That's the only one with songs, right? I mean, there is a song in Toy Story 2. But like when I will go sailing no more or whatever that... What is it? Huh. Well, that yeah, that's... That's the, showing Buzz's misery or whatever. That's telling us how he feels through a song. Right. Now, it's Randy Newman warbling during, during that song rather than having Tim Allen actually sing it. But that's what that is. And the part in Toy Story 2 that everybody came out of was the Sarah McLaughlin song right. scene. Where somehow, and I, part of it was her, her voice. And part of it was just that they dared go that low, you know, in, in, a, in a Pixar family G-rated little kids movie. But that is the that's the most emotion we'd ever gotten in a Pixar movie up to then. The first time that people cried, or that people everybody cried, where they talked about that, and uh, right, you, you, oh, well, sorry, but what what are we talking about? Oh, going. What I want to do is anti Disney. Right. What doing an what audience you think needs. is cool as a writer versus what an audience is actually going to respond to. Um, okay, well, an example might be when Brave was the bear and the bow. Okay. It was much more Scottish folklore of an actual fairy tale type thing from Scotland's history. And I think that they had f tried to fit in a lot more of, you know, actual, you know, we'll go to Scotland and we'll read up on Scottish minutia <laughs> and we'll get to do all this stuff about, you know, what their you know, the people believed in Scotland 500 years ago and, and, and the kilts and we'll talk about the, you know, the, oh, and, and that'll be so much fun. And then ultimately at some point they said, well, we're going to try and make it more universal. And we're going to just, we're going to focus on the character of Merida and, and her mother and make it more about that than about magic and, the hero's journey. I I I don't know because we again yeah, we, we don't, don't know, know what they uh, the, what they threw out, what way they looked at that rule and said, oh, you know what, we're gonna have to dump the the fifteen minute dance sequence that you wanted to put in. I know that sounds cool to you as a writer because you love so you think you can dance so much, but uh, the audience might not really want to go there. 
the interpretive dance thing where Merida puts on that black leotard and her and her mom <laughs> act out their feelings through dance. We may have to dump that sequence. I'm sorry. That ended up on the DVD, though, right? Well, of course. Okay. I mean, they they animated the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. Though That's why I was saying the only example I can think of is what you already mentioned, where they're just like, oh, we are not doing this, not doing this, because that's just not cool. We're doing something different. Well, another- and then everybody said, you know what? I know you really want to be different, but... The reason they do that is because it's good. Because it works, yeah. I remember when Incredibles, when the DVD came out, there was all this extra stuff about the just the myriad superheroes that Brad Bird had created. And they all had funny names, and they all had powers, and, and you could read up on them or, or watch a little feature add on each one of them and all that. And almost none of it made it into the movie. Yeah. There was like gazer beam or whatever mentioned, and we see his. his yeah, corpse. a few of them they throw it out real quick. Dying guy was sucked through the plane by his cape, and this. But they, yeah, I, that as a writer would be a blast to come up with a dozen superheroes and their powers and and such, and, and right. so maybe that's part of it as well. It's just something yeah, that he would have that... enjoyed doing. But it, it had to be more about the family. It had to be smaller. Right. You know, it, yeah, it's 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 kind of like we. I mean, this isn't a Pixar related reference, but often we talk about um, J.K. Rowling and you know her magnum opus of the Harry Potter series, and all the stuff that we know that she has. That is basically she's the only one that knows about because, yeah, she put it in the notebook as she was preparing to write this series. And so she knows the backstory to this guy and this guy and that guy and the other guy and everybody. And, the you know, the garbage collector that comes and takes the trash away from the Dursley's house. She knows, you know, that this guy's marriage is on the rocks. All that kind of stuff. But we don't know it. I mean, that's cool to her. But... Harry Potter, those books were long. For children's books, they were surprisingly long. And we didn't need them to be, you know, Shogun level long, It level long. The Stand, after it's been at, you know, the, the, the re-release of The Stand level long. Because, nobody, you know, people aren't going to read it. They're going to get bored and that's one of those things you will often complain about with Stephen King, where he's just like, oh, he goes into all this detail, and then, of course, kills that character the very next page. So all that detail is just a waste of time. You know, I mean, that's fun as a writer to come up with details for all that crap. Like you were saying, to come up with all the myriad superheroes. But for an audience, not so neat. We don't need to know the life story of the trash collector just to, so that he can come by and co- grab the trash. I don't know. Something like that. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, uh, that's rule number two. Um, so that one's harder because it's much more inside baseball. We don't know. If we had Stanton here, we could ask him. You know, He's like, oh, I did research on so many kinds of fish. And, you know, oh, did you know that purple tangs do this? And do this. And he's like, I tried to find a way for Dory to do that. Or is she a blue tang? I assume she's a blue tang because she's blue, but I don't know. But I ultimately I had to toss all that because, you know, it's there's no way of knowing. Yeah, but um, I think it's still a, a good rule to keep in mind. Just, I suppose, as you make a decision, what way you're going to go or whatever, keep in mind. Not just because you as a writer think it's cool, but what would an audience think? And I guess that is kind of a, one of those things, and I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about that too, is that you know when you're writing a novel, you need to know what your audience is for that novel, or when you're writing a story, think about what the audience is going to be for that story, and you know try and tailor it for that. So if you're trying to write a YA novel, you know there's certain things you can do and sh- other things that you shouldn't do, and you know even though those things you shouldn't do would be awesome. Maybe you better not. Uh, something like that. 
That's my two cents. Okay. Second worst, mar- worst marathon. It is, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> maybe we can redeem ourselves in the next one. All right. Well, thanks for listening, folks. We'll be back again tomorrow with another little tidbit, another rule. See how it goes. I'm Big Anklevich. I'm Rich Outfield. Good night. That Gets My Goat is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, meaning share it with everyone, but don't sell it or change it.